Welcome once again to The Sage. Thank you for having been with us on this journey. I'm excited because today we're starting something a little different from what we've been showing you in the past. And in order to introduce that concept, let me say, let us again revisit the concept of the sage. A sage is somebody who is humble and wise enough to have traveled down the journey of life, seen a lot, done a lot, learnt a lot, and acquired the humility to synthesize it and attempt to use it with others to improve the world. That is my understanding of the sage. And that is what we try to do in this show. But very important for us is the concept, or perhaps I should say the truth, that underlies it all, that this world is good. That people, most people within the world are good. If we learn to see the good, if we learn to live the good, we will realize that our existence on this earth is possible, is happiest when we assume the good the Creator wanted for us. And that is what has driven our enthusiasm with the show. That is why we think it's worthwhile to unearth hidden treasures. Why do I say hidden? Because many times they're there, but we fail to have the eyes to see them. In the previous series of this show, we've brought wonderful, talented young people to your attention. They have discussed their journey. They have discussed their accomplishments. And we have all been inspired and enriched by them. We are beginning a new leg of that journey. And within many of the subsequent shows, sometimes we will bring in other sages onto the stage. Once they were young, they have traveled that journey of life. They have accomplished. We are going to bring them to you. They will tell their story. They will share them with you. They will tell you what they've been through in order for them to get to the heights they have gotten to. And in listening to them, in benefiting from their wisdom, we as a people, we as human beings will grow and learn and share and be better for it. It is indeed exciting. And for me as the sage, ha, huh, it's so I'm so it's so pleasurable. There's nothing like unwrapping a beautiful present. And the deeper you go, the more you see the treasures in there, the more you're enriched, humbled, and strengthened. Kicking off this new phase of the sage is a truly wonderful specimen of what I am talking about. An accomplished lady, 47 years a lawyer, a lady who has traveled this journey of life as a mother, as a wife, particularly for us on this show, she's also going to tell us as a legal luminary. She has reached, scaled the ladder. She has reached the top of her profession. Today, she's retired. But she's a wealth of wisdom. There's so much to learn from her. Stay with me. We'll be back in the next segment. Welcome back to The Sage. And thank you for having stayed with us. This is going to be a wow of a show. It's interesting that actually it's more difficult to get these seasoned sages, my fellow sages, to come on set. It's more difficult to get them than to get the young ones. And so I think you, my audience, need to give me a special pat on the back for having succeeded 
in bringing this wonderful lady to be with us today on the show. As I said in the last segment, she's a legal luminary. 47 years, a lawyer, and she has done the whole bit from bottom to top. Let me also confess that I have known her for many, many years. And so in between, as we talk to her, I shall sneak in those side view knowledge of her, behind the scenes knowledge of her that I have. But trust me, all of them wonderful. Please join me as we welcome no other than Mrs. Carol Ndagoba to the show. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for this privilege. It's a pleasure. Thank you for agreeing to be with us. And thank you for agreeing to share the journey. You eventually forced me into this, <laughs> but I'm very happy to be <laughs> <laughs> Please tell us, let's start. So please tell us a little about yourself. How did it start? We know what's we know what what's been the journey like. Well, um, like any journey in life, there's been ups and downs. But when I think back, I consider myself as um, one of those born with silver spoon in their mouth. My childhood was wonderful. In fact, I come from my parents wonderful people. My father was one of the first medical doctors in Igbo land when people were not going to school. So you can see that uh, I had a good childhood. And he was a doctor in those days when you qualify as a doctor. The first thing they do, they were in Lagos. They give you a house in Ikoi. They give you a car to go with it. You think of those good old days. It doesn't happen anymore. People you can say that again. Yeah, people <laughs> leave school. Ten years, they're still looking for work. So my, my childhood was very good. My parents were exemplary. And they brought us up properly. We were seven. Seven of us in my family. I was number three. I almost forgot. You forgot? <laughs> <laughs> Number three in the family. So one of the older ones. And um, we lived in Lagos. We lived uh, in the West. We lived in Oshogbo. And uh, believe it or not, that was the best place for me. Growing up, it was wonderful. Oshogbo in those days. I, we had wonderful, wonderful memories of our sojourn in Oshogbo. We stayed there five years, but it's a time in my life I can never forget. Because my father was a doctor, and in those days, you know, in a whole town, you can just have one doctor, one. And he would take care of neighboring uh, states, neighboring towns, really. So when we were in Oshogbo, he used to drive to Ede, he used to go to Akure, you know, places like that. One doctor, they worked very hard, but they were good. They were well-trained doctors. We went to school there. We loved it. You can imagine uh, we lived uh, in the GRA, big, big compound with a football field. This is a luxury you can't get now, never. So I grew up like in my childhood and many a time let me tell you the truth i still think back with with nostalgia and i think of those good old days we we toured everywhere we lived in the midwest as it was then called that's uh, delta edo now went to school there i went to school in Sapple. i went to school in Wari. i went to school in benin you're a true nigerian huh? a true nigerian <laughs> yes <laughs> Uh, I can only, I didn't go to school in, in, I was, they had left the North, my parents, when I, 
I was born. So my experience was of the West. And I speak Yoruba like a native. There was a time I thought that was my main language. But I still spoke my own language, Igbo. Um, I decided to, growing up, we had a lot of, I had a lot of choices. I was doing well in most of my subjects. So choosing a career was not very difficult for me. But one thing I knew for sure was I was never going to be a medical doctor. With due respect to Dr. Buago, I hated hospitals. I hated messy things. I hated to see blood. So I knew, and my father knew then too, that my interest was not in the <laughs> medical direction. I went to the University of Ife. Um, then, which had a very good law faculty. It's a wonderful university. I'm very proud of it. In fact, I look down on other universities. But it's not University, university of Nigeria. No, it's not university, but it's University of Ife. <laughs> OAU, but they had wonderful lecturers. <laughs> we had the most beautiful campus in the country. It still is. And uh, I read law there. The lecturers were wonderful. Went to the law school. And eventually, I was called to the bar in 19, to the Nigerian bar in 1974. Wow, that's a long time ago. <laughs> the first, <laughs> before some of you were born. <laughs> so I've been a lawyer for quite some time now. And I think uh, it has taken a toll on me, but it's all very good. There's no toll. We can't see any toll. What? <laughs> Thank you. But uh, immediately I finished. In fact, we were the first, uh, it was while I was in the university in my final year that the concept of youth co started in Nigeria. We were the set that rioted. I was in, I don't riot, but it was our set that rioted against, uh, you can imagine, you're really looking forward to coming out and being somebody. Suddenly, you're told, uh, you have to go and do one year national service. We didn't take kindly to it. But eventually, it turns out to be a wonderful thing in the country. Well, that's interesting. So you're yeah. saying, actually, that when youth service started, yeah. students were not happy. They were not. The first time it was not. Because, you know, people graduate, they start work. And then you're told that when you graduate, you, you, you go and serve, uh, go camping, serve for one year. No, it was... We, we rioted, but it didn't work. <laughs> you had to do However, it. However, we lawyers, we are giving exemptions. So, okay, um, the law students can go to the law school. They don't have to serve. So they can serve after law school, law school mm -hmm. which is what happened. So I can't rightly say that we were the first set of youth coppers, but we were the first set of lawyers for youth coppers. And uh, eventually we found it wasn't a bad thing at all. Yeah. I did my youth call in Lagos. And I worked in the Lagos State Ministry of Justice for my primary assignments. And I can, I can tell you, I got a lot of experience from working there. Because it was like slave driving. We were in court every day. All I knew about court was my surgeon in the Lagos State Ministry of Justice. Okay, that's interesting. Yes, we prosecuted, we were, you know, there we had what was called assizes. All those are not in existence anymore. We had assizes. What is that? What is that? Nice? Months, okay. You go prosecuting. Okay. Constant for three good months, you stay in the court prosecuting. Okay. And it was a great experience for me. You, and you know, you, you felt good. Put on your wig and gown. Every morning, you're there with your seniors that took you there. They, I remember I went for these exercises with this honorable Justice Okwala of blessed memory. He was a big inspiration to me. He was a good um, prosecutor. That was my first touch. Firm, I'm, firm I'm, I'm sure. Fantastic. Then in uh, civil litigation, I met uh, somebody like uh, Mrs. Uh, Turi Akerele in the Lagos State Ministry of Justice. You know, we, I got a lot in just one year. So eventually, youth court 
was uh, a United, blessing, yeah, a big blessing. From there, I now started work. I was employed in the Federal Ministry of Justice. That was in 1975, August. And uh, I was there and climbed through the ladder from one department to the other, still prosecuting, civil litigation. Wonderful. A lot of work. Okay. You, you don't know what it means to go to court. You know, you, you get all the uh, 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 butterflies in your stomach. Because I remember a young lawyer, just one year old at the bar, standing in front of judges. Yes, uh, Mrs. Sindagua, can you call your case? My Lord, I am uh, this. I'm a pupil state counsel at the Federal Ministry of Justice. And lo and behold, the person on the other side of the case was an SEM. I was trembling, but I didn't let them know. I said, what have I done to myself? Why did I leave <laughs> I should have done very well with my French. <laughs> okay, <she said. laughs> but uh, after uh, a few trials, I became quite adept at because I had to do it all my life. Prosecuted, civil litigation, and so on. Going to court became... Something you were used to. Yes, and uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, finally, in the year 2003, I was appointed the pioneer executive secretary of NAPTI. You say, what is NAPTI? It's the Agency Against Human Trafficking. And I'm proud to say that uh, I was the pioneer. Let's stop you there. Let's stop you there. That is good. That sounds extremely exciting. <laughs> we'll come back. When we come back, we'll listen to Mrs. Ntangoba tell us about NAPTI. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Sage. And thank you for having stayed with us. Before we took a break, Mrs. Ntangoba was going to tell us about her career, about her job founding executive secretary of NAPTE. But let me use again my knowledge, like I had said before, I had confessed before, of her as a person uh, and her career to stop her, keep us in suspense and tell her that even before she goes on to that, can she tell us a bit more about that journey before she got there? And let me also say something about her that um, she will never be in a position to say but because I know her so well, I can say. She's described her childhood. She's described um, her moving around, the privilege of moving around this country um, with parents. But I was, I've also known her for so long. And one of the most remarkable things, or perhaps the most endearing things about Mrs. Ndagoba, she's a woman of amazing, amazing generosity. In fact, those of us who know her know that without thinking, she will give you the last shirt on her back. And it's only after she's given it to you that she will remember, okay, actually, I don't have any other one. <laughs> and that was her. And because she's so loving and so giving, I also know that her home is always full. It's always full of family and friends who she brings in, welcomes, and who stay, believe me, years in her house uh, so many of her our cousins her cousins so many of her husband's cousins tell will tell that story of her so sometimes it's good to bring in this bit because when a woman sits and tells you about her career you don't get that picture of a woman who is the proverbial woman in the in the book of wisdom who is kind generous hard-working and so given. This, I assure you, is a woman of that nature. Mrs. Nagoa, thank you again for being with us. So thank please you. tell us a little bit more about your yes. career before we go into the climax yes. of NAPTIP. Okay. Yes, um, before my career, I, I would love to mention my husband. My husband is the known Ike Nandagoba the non-broadcaster. 
it was very well known. And I will tell you funny anecdotes about what happened all through my career in relation with my husband. Because um, anywhere you go, um, be before I could finish, what uh, mother, you know, I said, um, Carol Ndagba. Oh, is it the same Ndagoba? So sometimes it's as if <laughs> he was towering like his colossus and <laughs> overshadowing me anywhere <laughs> I went. It was always him. You would think he is the one working in the place. And uh, in fact, uh, I, I think I enjoyed the attention <laughs> that uh, that brought me. Even later in my naptive days, it helped me a lot in the agency because I could now walk in somewhere, introduce myself. Oh, he can and I go back. Oh, that man is wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. The voice, the voice of Nigeria. <laughs> I said, well, thank God. <laughs> Before I used to resent it and say, ah, can't they just listen to me? I have my own uh, virtues, you know. <laughs> but before you say one thing, they say, Kenanda Guba, wow. <laughs> no, that man is a prodigy. But he's a blessed memory now. I'm sure all our older viewers remember Ikenna Ndagoba the one of the most famous broadcasters we ever had, literally known as the Golden Voice, um, who left for sure an indelible mark in our memories, in our hearts, in the communication and media industry in this country. Um, so we, in a way, um, on behalf of his wife and everybody else, I also acknowledge and honor him in this program. So sorry to have interrupted you. Go ahead now. <laughs> when I was in the Ministry of Transport as legal advisor, I used to attend the International Maritime Organization meetings in London. It was work all through. Because you represent your country. Any mistake, you come home, you are dealt with. The president is waiting for you. You dare not take a decision, a wrong decision on behalf of the country. No way. You consulted a lot. Luckily, we had a Nigerian there who at least helped us too. So you prepare. You go for foreign meetings. You sit there, prepare, knowing that whatever you do there is your country. You are yeah, representing. has repercussions for your yeah, country. Plenty. And uh, this is uh, like you might have a meeting six times a year. And the um, Minister of Finance, we attended the World Bank. Um, international finance, all of them. It, it was a wonderful experience. Even then, then, well, then I didn't think it was wonderful. <laughs> you thought it was, was a lot so of work. Much work. But thinking back now, it was a lot of experience because I got a lot of commendation. And then eventually, um, I ended up as a director public prosecutions in the Ministry of Justice. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, and uh, but it was quite a scary job because then <laughs> we were prosecuting, um, you know what it means, corrupt officers, people that you, you have to prosecute, you go to court. The DPP, that is your job. It's not a glamour job. And then from there, I had a desk at the DPP that dealt on trafficking because this is leading me up to how I came into trafficking. Remember, um, we used to think, everybody thought uh, these girls we saw. You see pictures, uh, photographs on TV. You see them, um, they say, uh, we call them, not me, but people call them prostitutes. Our girls are prostituting in Italy. We didn't know it was in prostitution. We didn't know it was enslavement. It was deception. Let me stop Mrs. Ndagoba there. Yeah. And say that what she says so lightly, she was appointed the first executive secretary of the agency of NAPTEP. But I'll tell you how it happened. Okay. 
Because that is big. You see, there's something you call the, the Palermo Convention. Okay. It's an international convention. Um, Nigeria became a signatory to that convention. Mrs. Uh, Atiku had this passion because she, in her career, some, she was lecturing in Kaduna Polytechnic. She went to Italy and saw our girls all dressed in skimpy clothes. You know, very, you could say, what are they doing? And then she, she found, say, prostitution. In winter, they are skimpily dressed and they are being shivering and being taken away by men. So she now made up her mind that she would do something about it. That was how she thought about what cleft. So she now got people like um, Justice Odili. They all and they formed a committee and drafted um, the law on trafficking in persons. So you can see that it was an NGO that, that actually drew precisely drew attention to it. She followed it all through in the House. Eventually, it was passed into law, and it was during um, Chief Obasanjo's time as president. And her husband was the vice president, so she was able to push it through, and he signed it. Because you see, once the president signs, then you, you have ratified, and it becomes law. So that was in May, May 2003. Mm -hmm. And the minute it was done, because I, was, I had gone for a few meetings handling the matter as a desk, something in my department, of public prosecutions, injustice. So she thought, of, she now recommended when uh, uh, Obasanjo wanted um, an ES, executive secretary, the first time. I was still thinking about it. Oh, oh dear. Because for me, DPP was a big was position. A big, big position. <laughs> I mean, for you to be a DPP. And then to leave it and uh, become executive secretary. But one of my lawyers said, ah, no, no, madam, this is a, fed, it's going a federal parastatal. So, but before I could even say anything, I, I heard my name. I was announced as the executive secretary. But you see, when you hear it, oh, it was rejoicing, but it wasn't for me because I was petrified. We will stop you there. Yeah. We will stop you there. Because I know that Mrs. Ndagoba's story as the executive secretary of NAPTEP, foundation executive secretary, is a truly, truly enthralling one. We will keep you in suspense. We will continue the story in the next segment. Thank you for being with us. Don't forget to tune in again so that you catch it. It is a story and a journey worth hearing about. Mm. It is a real discovery of talent and dedicated, courageous work for our country. Thank you. <music>